the living God spirit that is blowing through this place right now. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for these people. And I thank you for your presence here with us. May my words bring life. And may we leave this place with a deeper trust in you. So I'm going to try to preach without a manuscript. And this is very new for me. So if there's something that you're not really following, feel free to give me one of these. <laughs> and if there's something that's moving you, please feel free to respond in any way you see fit. Because today's sermon is on the kingdom of God. And as you heard in the parables, that can be very confusing. And as I went through the process of trying to come up with this sermon, I realized how many blocks I had towards really understanding what Jesus was talking about in these parables. And speaking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, heaven can feel very discordant with our times. We're a little bit more comfortable turning on the television and seeing dystopian realities on CNN or seeing shows about dystopian realities. So heavenly blisses can seem very far off. And when I hear the word heaven, I'm taken back to a moment when I was six years old on an airplane and I sat next to a man named Armadillo Jim. And Armadillo Jim didn't need to even introduce himself because his belt buckle said it in silver. Armadillo Jim. He had the cowboy hat, he had the boots, the whole thing. And he turned to six-year-old me and he said the words that you really hope you don't hear when you're going on an airplane. He looks at me and he goes, you saved? Are you saved? And I grew up in the UCC, so I really didn't know what he meant by that. I grew up in New Jersey. And, uh, and you know, so I asked him, I basically shrugged my shoulders and asked him what he meant. And he talked to me about these heavenly blisses, a place up in the sky with billowing clouds and trumpets sounding and golden gates. So my six-year-old self was just like, I am in. <laughs> so I strutted off that plane and I said to my parents, I'm saved, I'm saved. <laughs> and my dad gave my mom this look like, I knew we shouldn't have let him fly alone. <laughs> But it's even more than theology or a certain kind of Christian theology. There's a thinking in Western society that in order for something to be sacred, it needs to be set apart. That what is really holy or really good is usually known because it's so up high, whether it's steeples of churches for people who are in their very best behavior, or if it's an office building where the people who are the most successful have the offices that are way up on top. And I, you know, went to seminary, consider myself progressive, so I've said things before like the kingdom of God is within, the kingdom of God is amongst us, it's here and it's now. But as I've been going through this sermon, I've realized this idea that the kingdom of God is contained in a certain place really still lives in me. And I always have to go against that block. And one of the places that I have recognized the kingdom of God is an apartment in the Bronx. And this apartment is the home of three Ghanaian students from Union Theological Seminary. And when times were difficult at seminary, I would go over there and just feel so filled feel so heard, feel so seen. And it's an amazing place because it's the type of place where the windows have plants and flowers in every window and they all seem to grow and flourish and the people who come into this apartment take on the same kind of ease and serenity that Duke, Judith, and Abraham exude. So, you know, when they asked me to live in the apartment in the Bronx, last year, I felt like Peter was opening the gates and I was just walking into the kingdom of heaven. I was saved. I was saved. Duke, Judith, and Abraham had saved me. So for the past year, it's been really great in that we've had great times. I've never been happier in terms of where I'm living ever 
But at the same time, I've realized that I've been trying not to let any kind of conflict in. I've been trying to make sure that no confusion gets in because this is my sacred space and I want to protect it. Plus, I'm a white guy in a Ghanaian apartment. So I really don't want to mess up the heaven that they've created. I really don't want to ask a, a question and it come off as a microaggression. I don't want to hurt them either. And that has created a situation where a lot of communication has not been happening. Because we've been protecting, or really, I feel like I've been protecting my idea of what this sacred space is. And it took the death of this poor plant. This plant that looks like a flagpole turned over with the flag at half mast. It took the death of this plant for me to realize that we can't go around just protecting our sacred spaces and pretending that we can keep conflict out. So Duke, who is really the gardener of our apartment, one day he approached me and he had this plant when it was alive. And he said, John, I got this plant from, from Union Seminary and I would love you to keep it. And when he said that, I was just like, I have arrived, you know. And he went on and he was like, yeah, your room has such sunlight streaming through. So I was really motivated. I looked up um, how I should take care of it. I was watering it religiously. Like, I even bought it a friend. I had a hanging plant right next to it. So it was really, it, it was doing great. And then I went to Texas. And while I was in Texas, I figured, you know, everything grows in this apartment. So I'm not going to worry about asking my apartment mates to water this plant. I had read that my hanging plant only needs to be watered once a week. It was going to be fine. So I get back from Texas and I look in the window. The sun was shining through and this is what I saw. And I freaked out. You know, like I couldn't even take care of this little pepper plant. So I brought this plant and I put it next to all of Duke's plants in the kitchen. And I thought, you know, maybe with its friends, you know, maybe there can be some kind of miracle that can occur here. And, but I just left it there. And I went back to uh, New Jersey to do some work. Actually got a root canal. Come back and Duke is standing in the kitchen holding this plant. And he goes, John, it makes me really sad that you abandoned your plant. And I got really defensive. I, you know, I didn't abandon the plant. I, I thought it would have better luck out here. It, it died in my room. And I was starting to get really hot as I said that. You know, because in my mind, in that time, I was defensive, thinking, you know, I haven't confronted you with my questions. I haven't come to you with my concerns and now you're getting mad at me about a plan? And, and it came out in that moment and it was hard. So he said, I think we need an apartment meeting. And that's not the way our apartment does things. We don't like have formal sit down meetings. But it was clear that we needed that kind of meeting. And during the meeting, Duke looked at me and he said, if you feel like you can't express hard questions, if you feel like you can't say difficult truths, even though you call this your Mount Zion, even though you call this your Kingdom of Heaven, is it really the Kingdom of Heaven if you can't bring your whole self here? And that rocked me. That rocked me deep to the core. Because my ideas about what the Kingdom of God was, what Heaven was, died <laughs> that day with this poor plant. And we ended up having a really fantastic conversation, very open. And I was able to express things, they were able to express things, and we still woke up the next morning. We were all still there. No one abandoned one another. We were still in this apartment. And I had had this record player in my room that had all the records and had the speakers, but the speakers weren't plugged in and the record player wasn't plugged into the wall even though I had been living there for 10 months and I love music. And for whatever reason, because we had that conversation, I spent the morning plugging in and creating that record player space. And I noticed that Duke was walking around the apartment with his shirt off. Everyone just seemed a lot more comfortable. 
But it took a difficult conversation and it took me realizing that I was carrying all of these assumptions and that I was trying to protect the sanctuary of the space. But by not letting any messiness in, I also wasn't allowing for the good to come in either. This is when I return to my outline because I'm bringing it home, hopefully. <laughs> so when we return to the teachings, when we turn to the teachings of Jesus, we are reminded again that just like this plant, Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God as a place that is down to earth, that is in the earth. We have to remember that Jesus was teaching in the valley to rural people of Galilee. And he was using metaphors like seeds, soil, and harvest because he wanted to speak to where they were. However, it can be so easy for us in the sanctuaries of our life, especially in this moment when it seems so chaotic, for us to want to protect these spaces and not let any of the hard stuff in. But if we don't let the messiness in, if we don't allow a little bit of our life to be out of control, then we don't allow for grace to come in as well. The idea of a refuge is not about being set apart. It's not about being free of conflict. But it's about allowing there to be places where new growth can come in and where the kingdom of God can be realized right here and right now. Because the truth is, is that life in so many ways is out of our control. Like me, losing my place in this sermon right here was my biggest fear. And it happened right there, and it's happening on Facebook Live. And it's happening on Facebook Live. But, so much of life is out of our control. Can we, can we control the sun from shining? Can we control the rain from falling? Let me try that again. Can we control whether the rain falls in our life? No, sir. Can we control the sun from pouring in? No. What we can do is we can till the soil of our life through communication. We can take risks so we open up and we're truly vulnerable. Because even if it feels like rain, even if it feels like sun, it is all going to the growth of life. And it is all going to our transformation and our becoming. And our becoming closer to God and closer to one another. But it takes that vulnerability. And it takes making mistakes. And it takes misunderstanding. And coming back and taking another risk. And truly being together. So I thank you for allowing me to take risks. I thank you for being with me in my mistakes just now. I love you. And amen. amen.